Hi, everybody. Welcome to Life Stories. I'm so glad that you're here. Today on the podcast, I speak with Jeannie Blasberg, who with her husband has Flynn Creek Farm in Wisconsin. This is a regenerative farm and they are growing food and selling it to local restaurants in their area because they want to provide the best nutrient rich food that they can to people at an affordable price. And if you will go to their website, which I'm going to include uh, in my notes, go look at their vegetables, <laughs> go look at these. I just can't stop talking about how gorgeous they are. What she's doing is fascinating. And it's, you know, it's a lot of work. Our word of the week this week. It's the word of the week. Is opportunity. There are a lot of us on this planet that have opportunities to do things to help people that not everybody has. And she talked about the opportunity that she had, the resources that she had, and that she realized it was kind of a luxury to be able to do what she's doing, but she wanted to do it. She wanted to make a difference. I love when I'm talking to people on this podcast who are making a difference and who have that desire to make a difference. She took the opportunity that she had. And I hope that as you listen, you will think about opportunities that you have in your area, in your circle, in your life to maybe help somebody. Maybe you can't start a farm, but maybe you can do something else that can help. I feel like when we don't take these opportunities that we are given, they are wasted. And who wants to do that? I certainly don't. And I'm sure I have, but I want to be more aware of the opportunities that I have. I thank you for listening. I hope you have a great day. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So I, you know, I'm talking to people all over the world, literally, but I have a goal to speak to someone in every state. And so you're representing Wisconsin today. So you are it. But I am talking to people that are helping people all over the world doing incredible things. And so I love, um, I love what you're doing with your farm. And I want to know how and why you got started doing it. And where did the name come from? Uh, Well, Flynn Creek Farm is Mm -hmm. the name of our farm, and we actually bought the farm, and it had that name already because Flynn Creek Creek runs through the land. So we have about 420 acres, about 20 of which is wetland, and the the creek runs through that, but it also um, is a – that creek and the greater Sugar River – our elements of our um our neighborhood and important parts of the watershed here okay and how and why did you get the farm started what made you want to ever do that well um during covid my husband and i looked at each other and thought this world has a lot of problems There's the climate crisis, there's food insecurity, there's a health crisis in our country. Um, We have intelligence and resources and the ability to move because our children were launched into their adult lives and our parents were either gone or fine. (laughs) You know, my, (laughs) we lost three out of our four parents and my father is still alive, but has a young wife who takes very good care of him. So we weren't necessarily in that sandwich generation needing to take care of the generations on either side of us. And we have, you know, once we sold our house in Boston and simplified in other ways, we freed up resources and we thought if we ever come out of this pandemic (laughs) and recognize the country we live in, we'd like to make I say kind of this last chapter, but my husband's like, it's not our last chapter, but whatever. We want to make this big next chapter like meaningful and have this and try to address some of the concerns we have. We were really in this lifestyle where we were working and earning money to kind of fund a life of, I don't know, affluence and leisure and you know, vacations and country clubs. And I mean, I don't know if I want to say this on your podcast, but I felt sick to my stomach that that those weren't really our values. And so um, funneling what we could into this farm and putting our 
blood, sweat, and tears into it has kind of been a grand experiment. It's definitely a luxury because we can afford to fund losses for a handful of years, but we are also learning so much and, cre and gaining so much compassion around these issues. Um, you can look at conventional farms and farmers with the monocropping and the fertilization and spraying as like evil people who are causing all these problems. But once you get into farming, you really understand the risks of making change and how we kind of got into this mess. It's not going to be that easy to get out. Anyway, John and I decided to kind of walk the walk and stop talking about good food and good health and the environment and actually try to put our money where our mouth was. And um, so so we did it when we um, had never been to Wisconsin before, but an old family friend connected like maybe months after we'd put it out in the world and actually started talking about this in public. Um, we'd, we'd been looking at farm property, but we started telling people that we wanted to do it and we were looking. Um, an old family friend reconnected and said he actually wanted to be a farmer and had a lot of experience both apprenticing on farms and as a chef in a kitchen and there's this cool connection between cooking and food and sometimes organic farmers don't necessarily deliver the food to the kitchen in the way that can is the most saleable or the anyway there were a lot of opportunities we saw in terms of like closing in on that gap and he also introduced us to this chain of fast casual restaurants so we're vertically integrated with um, seven locations right now that are taking our veg for a salad bowl type of concept and they mm -hmm. will be growing and will be growing and we see it as a way to get food in people's mouths for a fairly affordable price and um, yeah. yeah part of this was like you know so many people are overweight or have diabetes or, or diet related illnesses and it's not necessarily any people's fault it's just our food system delivers food that's highly processed and sprayed with all sort, sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the health of the food is really a result of the health of the soil. And the way we're farming in this country is degrading the topsoil and creating a lot of erosion and runoff into water. And um, yeah, so there's just, we thought, you know, we have 420 acres, we're doing our part, but we're also seeing if it can be done to tackle like all these problems at once, like something might have to give. Can we pay people the way we want to? Can we sell the food at an affordable price? And can we have all these other things happening here? Um, it kind of feels like we're learning. And if we can do it, hopefully this is a replicatable model. Sure. So you must have, I mean, how many people do you have working for you? Because I spoke to a woman in uh, Virginia that had a 150 acre farm and, and they had thousands of volunteers. So for yours to be so much bigger, how many people do you have working on that farm? We have about 25 acres dedicated to our veggie production right now. And that's the most labor yeah. intensive. So I'd say I have about 14 yeah. people working on the veg oh, wow. side of things. Um, and then I have a crew of three or four that are all over the habitat helping out take care of the animals we have sheep and goats right now we're bringing on cattle next year um, yeah. all because it creates this regenerative system and we're using their manure to create our own fertility products and then we're also you know the ruminants just grazing on the grass is so good right. for the pastures so um Okay, so I'd say the real labor intensive side is the veggie production and, and that's right. like 14 and that's why local organic produce is expensive. It's very labor intensive. Yeah, yeah it is. And I was going to ask you, but you just kind of answered that question. What was different about your farm than someone else who's just farming and selling, you know, what they have, but this is, I, I watched one of your videos in your vegetables were gorgeous I was just um ogling your basil <laughs> like it was beautiful just lush and so big and thick and oh I my was gosh. in the greenhouse yesterday so we have a greenhouse that's a pretty substantial building and it's serving right now as a wash pack facility one half of it is where we 
wash all the veg that comes out of the field and pack it up nicely for delivery to the restaurants. And in that process yesterday, they were washing and putting basil in these so boxes. And I just buried my face in it. And <laughs> I said to one of our employees, if people could do this nobody would uh, need like sris or depression medication right. or anxiety medication there's something about breathing in that basil that is like no. oh my god it's so beautiful i just want to take a bite of it it just oh it just smells so good i mean i have my base is this big you know it's not it's not huge but oh i love it and it was all of your stuff that in that video is just gorgeous stuff thank you so where do you do you um the restaurants are all local Right. So Forage Kitchens was founded about nine years ago in downtown Madison by a guy who went to the mm -hmm. University of Wisconsin. And so the first location was just really close to campus. And it's become, mm -hmm. I don't know, in Texas, if you have like Sweet Greens, that's more of a national chain. But it's very similar in terms mm -hmm. of uh, you go through a line, you can pick a menu item or you can build your own salad bowl. But it's um, a sal oh, wow. uh, like a greens base with some grain, you can pick a protein, but then you have a selection of like 20 or so other veggies and an average meal would probably be around $15. So it's not cheap, but it's approaching like the a fast food option. Um, so mm -hmm. it's very popular with college women and college age women. And then we're finding as we're growing in Madison and also Milwaukee is only about an hour and a half drive from our farm. So we look deliver to three locations mm -hmm. in Milwaukee as well. And the strategy where my husband and I are also investors in this restaurant chain. So he sits on the board and mm -hmm. it has a say and kind of some input in expansion, but, um, the, the idea is to really get dense and grow in the state of Wisconsin because the distribution model is so much better. We can guarantee your bowl has food that was harvested within the last two days. And um, wow. we can't really make those marketing claims otherwise. And so much of the success of Forage we're learning is the connection to our farm and is the, the marketing opportunity. It really makes us different that we have a restaurant chain associated with its own farm. Now I say all this, but obviously we're in the state of Wisconsin, so we're not able to deliver veg 12 months a year yet. And we are nice. in a process where we have to build um, geothermal interior growing environments. And we haven't quite pulled the trigger on that yet, but we will. And so the goal is to be growing food for your salad bowl 12 months a year during the months of like May to October, you'll get a lot more ingredients from our fields. And then probably in the winter months, it will be mostly just the greens and the microgreens and the things that are easy to grow and harvest indoors. I gotcha. It's all, it was all just, uh, I loved the video. It was informative, but I, everything just looked so lush and beautiful. I know that your land that you're on is very special land. You, you talked about it some on your website. Tell me about the land where you are. So this part of the country is called the Driftless. It's a small little pocket that actually extends over four states. So mm -hmm. it's this little southwestern corner of Wisconsin. And then what would be the southeastern corner of Minnesota? And then the northern parts, a little bit of the northern parts of Iowa and Illinois. So in the last ice age, when most of the Midwest was kind of shaved flat by glaciers, this part was not touched. And it's called the Driftless because it's maintained this really incredible geological characteristics with rolling hills and all these creeks and streams and lakes, as I mentioned, but also really dramatic and magnificent rock formations and canyons. And so we really feel a lot of energy around these rocks and these outcroppings that are all over the land. Um, our land is 420 acres, but over 100 acres of it is forest with these huge rocks. And it's super wow. cool. It it just has a an ancient feel about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's actually a it part of our 
Yeah, there's a part of our land that mm-hmm. hadn't hadn't been farmed, and so a lot of the old oak trees still stand. And the oh original biome of this part of the state or this part of the world is a oak savanna. So we have these big oak trees with these beautiful grasses, um, savanna. I'm uh, sorry, um, Sudan grasses that will be what our cattle mm-hmm. graze on. But it's a really, mm-hmm. really special place because it hasn't been cleared completely for mm-hmm. farming by European settlers. It it has, we do have plenty of acreage that's been cleared clean of trees where we're growing some small, where we're growing grains. Um, but we also have that, I don't know, I'd say about 10 acres of just this pristine oak savanna. And then we're restoring some more. We're using goats to clear out the understory of some of our forests to bring it back to that oak savanna biome as well. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. So I asked these next two questions to everybody. Um, what is your favorite thing about what you were doing? You've, and but before that, you've had a lot of different, I saw that you were an athlete. I know that you're an author. You've had a lot of different jobs. So mm-hmm. what's your favorite thing about what you're doing now? Um, but well, I, I would say, get to even like yeah, that. I'd say all of my um, phases in life have included a great deal of creativity or the desire to be a creator, mm-hmm. whether it's being a mother or building a home of our own mm-hmm. or, you know, planting a garden, building a house, raising a kid. Mm-hmm. I've realized I really do like to have impact in a way that I'm leaving something permanent and hopefully something that's making the world or like my environment better. So, and expressing myself in these creative ways is important. And I told you the story of my husband and I looking at each other and saying, we've got to help the world more. We've got to just do something, get off our butts and stop talking about all the problems in the world and do something. Um, And so when we did that, I was kind of envisioning going to Wisconsin, setting this thing up, spending some money, creating a budget, and then going on with my life and maybe visiting Wisconsin here and there. (laughs) And the greatest, (laughs) most beautiful surprise is that this is taking 100% of our uh, brain space and energy, but I don't resent it in the least. It's like, um, it's exactly what I needed as a human. I, as we all do, we have healing that needs to go on and we have these wounds that we carry around and the pace of this farm, we have some urgency, but you can only go as fast as the seasons and the weather. And there's something beautiful about getting in tune with the natural rhythm of life. The work we're doing involves, like I said, 14 people who are young, passionate, committed young people, farmers who wanted, who, who work here, both because they love working outside, but they believe in our mission. And working with a team and collaborating has been incredibly good for me. I didn't really realize how isolated I had become as a writer and just as a person. And then... Mm-hmm. Um, There's something about the land and just, I I spoke about how beautiful this land is, but there's something actually um, magical about this place and, um, and just the farming community in general, it's incredibly hardworking and self-reliant and um, has so much to teach us. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is, um, (laughs) This has done so much for me. I hardly want to leave there. One of my books is about a summer community in Rhode Island, and it's based on what my family tradition was. And basically the vibe of the book is that people, why would you ever want to leave Rhode Island in the summer? And here I am on July 31st, not wanting to leave (laughs) um, the interior of the country. You know, I, I Mm -hmm. have just fallen in love and you know how, when you fall in love, it's unexpected. Like this has taken me by surprise, this passion. And so just when you think you have your whole life figured out and you're going to cruise into old age in a certain rocking chair, 
I've planted myself in a different place and I think my rocking chair is going to be someplace completely different. So it's been a process of self-discovery, <laughs> being a beginner again. Yeah. It's rejuvenated my life with a new purpose so that being a beginner has made me feel younger. My husband and I talk about the challenges on the farm and this business instead of hovering over our children and bothering them as they're in their late twenties and early thirties. I think they're really glad we have this thing going on yeah. that keeps us out of their lives and out of their hair. Um, yeah. And again, I just feel pretty young, active, um, strong, smart, I want to, I just want to see if we can figure this out every day. There's something that goes wrong and a challenge and every day there's something beautiful that happens as well. So it's really cool. Right. I love that. I love that. Um, what would you tell somebody who's listening, who has thought about farming, thought about, you know, had the same thoughts that you have, of we got to do something. What would you tell somebody that, that may be interested in even beginning to start something like what you're doing? Well, it's not for the faint of heart and it's not for somebody right. who's got um, a lot of stress around <laughs> retirement money. Let's just say, um, hopefully this <laughs> thing will break even because if it doesn't break even, it's definitely not going to be a replicatable model. But um, yeah. some of the things, if you want to just get started are join a CSA show up at a farm and get the food, get to know the farmer, learn about what grows in your area and what kind of land you have in the area in which you might want to farm. What's it best attuned to? You know, you we, we're veggie farmers in a land of uh, dairy and koi, uh, corn and soy. And that comes with its own challenges. You can't always force what you want to do on the land you're in. And then I would also just say, right. start, start small you can actually do a lot of production on very few acres and i think um that is probably the least intimidating way to get into it but if you're interested not just yeah. in like owning a farm but contributing to the food system and you're not able to go out and buy your own farm or you don't have the time to deal with it there's so much you can do in terms of the choices you make in your own food buying habits and your own consumerism that make a huge difference to supporting farms and farmers. And I don't need to go into that whole list, but um, buying local, buying organic, buying from farmers markets, joining a CSA, um, those are all things that anybody can really do. Absolutely. Um, the lady that I had on months ago who has a farm in Virginia, we talked about how, you know, it's this cycle food is expensive. And so people that cannot afford to buy good food, buy cheap food, which is horrible for you, which keeps you sick and overweight and, you know, these problems. And it's just the cycle. And so we talked about the same thing about wanting to break the cycle. How do we change that? Those are great. Those are great ways to, to do that. Yeah. Is there a moment that you had um, any kind of special moment that stood out to you maybe in the beginning when you started or something that you thought, okay, yes, this is, this is where I'm supposed to be. Oh, gosh. I Probably a lot. Oh, I'm an athlete, which means mm -hmm. I was a national champion in squash, and I am a very um, accomplished skier. And I, mm -hmm. um, I like to cycle. And the, I think one of the most beautiful ways of getting to know a region Maybe if you're a runner or a cyclist, you get out on the roads and you're going at fairly slow pace so that you can take in the scenery, but you can actually cover some ground so you get to understand a place. And it was when we first got here, there are a lot of people who cycle in this area because these long rural roads don't have much um, vehicle traffic and they're actually just perfect. Right. I don't know. I think one of the moments that I recall is our first summer here early in the morning coming back from a bike ride with my husband and approaching our farm and the way the light hit and you know there was like a mist in the air and mm -hmm. it almost felt like we had we've traveled the world i mean we've lived all over the world we're very um attuned to like 
going places and seeking experiences mm -hmm. and like trying adventure travel and wanting to have those moments that are like picture perfect out of the catalog or just that. And I don't know, it was almost like you don't need the world. It was saying you don't need to go anywhere. Everything you need, the beauty, the recreation, the nourishment you're getting, like it's all right here. And so I really do feel that strongly. I do have the benefit of having already gone through this phase where I've done a lot of sightseeing and travel and and now I just want to have like a deep authentic purpose-filled um, project and I don't really care I I want to do something here and I want to like be present and um and just like see the beauty where I am <laughs> I, I just mm -hmm. feel like then there was this moment where we came in on our bikes and I said if we're all we're doing is employing 14 people and allowing them to live a lifestyle they want and this thing never makes money but we just have this beautiful place to be like maybe it's all worth it i know that sounds really privileged and obviously like we own now this beautiful piece of land which will always be worth something great but i don't know it mm -hmm. it just felt like this was the right thing to do and there have been so many times on this path where opportunities have shown up for us, the right people at the right time have shown up for us. And so that's all me also saying, there's some underlying support for us to do this project. It's like the right thing for us to be doing. I'm not getting those like heebie-jeebie warning feelings, like what the heck did you get into? <laughs> go, you know, turn out the lights, sell this and go back to where you right. came from. I'm getting lots of validation yeah. along the way. Yeah. And we're starting to well, look, like you said, it. we're selling and we're, you know, we're starting to like the money's coming in. So that's good too. Sure. Well, I'm, I hope it, it works out and it evens out and you figure out what you need to, because I think it's so important. And I would love for people to be able to do this in different places. That has been my desire for all the people that I've met that are doing just incredible things. I would love for them to be able to see it and say, Hey, I can do something like that here. And farming is so important. It is so important. We have a garden. It's not huge, 50 by 50, I think, but we get overwhelmed with that. Just, you know, doing that it's, um, but we love it. We love those fresh vegetables and the fresh herbs and all the things that we get to do. And I just think it's so important for well, all so of many, us. So. so many kids don't know where their food came from and that's really a crime. No. And then the second it thing is, is, it is our farmers in this country have carried such a burden and carried so much stress. They live from year to year, not knowing if they're going to be able to pay off the debt that they had to take out to farm their fields based right. on the, the price of crops right now, grain and corn, the prices are going through the floor and there is a lot of stress. And, you know, I really wouldn't be as in tune with what's going on if I wasn't like living this life and my neighbors weren't feeling yeah. the pain that they're feeling. And so sure. I just think that so many people live in cities are detached from the food system of where their food comes from and people can really speak up in terms of policy around the farm bill that still hasn't been signed around all sorts of things just voting with your pocketbook and where you buy your food and who you support um it's just so important in so many ways yeah i agree and, i agree it is well you keep doing what you're doing and i'm i was excited to talk to you and um I'm going to point everybody to your website because I want them to go see what you're doing and see those gorgeous vegetables. I mean, just everything is just so big and lush and beautiful. I, I thank you for chatting with me. Oh, thank and you. I, it was such a, I, mean, I was excited about it. Such an honor to be on and uh, talk about this crazy thing that I did. And um, yeah, I mean, I would encourage women and people to understand like, we're going to live a long time and feel good about what you leave behind because um, we all should try to live the biggest lives we can. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful day. You too. All right. Bye-bye.